This channel is really good at covering tools and techniques, but for a woodworking channel, I do not make a ton of furniture. So how about this? How about we build a beautiful, traditional piece of furniture using cheap home store lumber, basic hand tools, a couple of simple joints, and have the whole thing done, start to finish, in two days. Sound good? Today, we're building the iconic six-board chest. If you do woodwork, you have got to know about this form because it is absolutely everywhere. This medieval chest is a six-board chest. This badass Viking sea chest is a six-board chest. And these lovely blanket and linen chests filling every farmhouse and antique shop all across America, every single one of them is a, well, you get the idea. Let's build one. This is the basic form. It's called a six-board chest for obvious reasons. And this simplicity of construction gives us all kinds of options. But first, we need some wood. These are white pine 1x12s from Home Depot. They're 48 inches long and 11 and a quarter inches wide. You can squeeze this project into five of them, but I recommend you buy a little extra. This wood is cheap, and some of it might cup badly. Give it at least a week to acclimate to your shop, and then we can start cutting. The top is the longest part, and it determines the size of everything else. So think carefully and leave it a little long just in case. The front and back are two inches shorter than the lid, and you want clear, straight timber, especially for the front. Cross-cut carefully and stay close to your lines to minimize trimming later. I'm using my saw at a shallow angle to track the line, and I'm blowing away the dust to keep everything visible as I work. The front and back boards will have some important joinery, and they need to be identical. So shoot them to the same length, and then put them together and joint a reference edge. Make sure they're labeled, and set them aside. The two ends are about half the length of the lid, and they can be made from leftover stock. Trim these boards to get rid of knots and make them the same size, but don't shoot them now. Just cut them and move on. The bottom is the length of the lid minus the thickness of the sides. But we're going to be dialing in the fit later, so don't trim this board. Leave it long. If you have any ugly wood, try to use it for the bottom, where no one's going to see it. With everything cut to length, it's time to flatten the stock. And this is kind of a balancing act. All of my boards cupped a little, and they all need to be flattened. But this cheap lumber is only 3 quarters of an inch thick. If I plane it down too much, my boards will be too thin. So. I'm going for a compromise. I take down the hump in the middle of each board, and then flip it over to work the high spots on either edge. It's not going to be perfect, so I'm shooting for a finished thickness of 5 eighths, and boards that are flat enough to join together. If you can find thicker lumber, I recommend it. But if all you have is the cheap stuff, don't let that stop you. With a sharp iron, you can get a lovely finish, but this white pine is soft and fragile. As I'm working, I notice that my bench is covered with dents and bumps and little bits of dried glue. This rough surface is going to destroy my freshly planed stock. So I take a break and plane the surface of my bench. I'm using the homemade jointer plane I built two weeks ago, and it's handling the job perfectly. There's a video and plans for building your own if you need a long plane. I'll put a link in the description. People often ask me if they should build their workbench top out of plywood or some synthetic material but I don't recommend it. Solid wood moves a little bit, but it's easy to level and put on a fresh surface anytime you want. All it takes is a sharp hand plane. Now we're ready for the joinery, and that's the most exciting part of this project, because there is no glue in this piece. The major joint is a simple rabbit, and it's held together with these rectangular cut nails. We use nails because the grain of the front and back goes this way, and the grain of the ends goes this way. This is called cross-grain construction, because these boards will expand and contract in opposite directions as the weather changes. We can't glue this construction because a rigid glue joint will just fail, so we need a connection that's both strong and flexible. This is where traditional cut nails come in. They wedge into the wood for a solid hold, but they also have the flexibility to move with the wood and stay together for centuries. I did a whole video about nailed joinery last week, and you can check that out if you need a refresher. The most important thing about using nails in your project is testing them out first. So let's do that now. I've got my rabbit joint cut in this scrap wood. Plus, I've got four nails and four drill bits. 
You drive these rectangular nails with the wide part going along the grain, and this causes them to wedge in place with incredible grip. But you can't just drive them straight in. They'll split the wood. Instead, you need to experiment with different diameter pilot holes, especially through the top board. The nails I bought for this project ended up being a little bit too big, so I also needed a small pilot hole in the bottom board. This is why testing is so important. I figured out all the details here, and there won't be any nasty surprises during assembly. If you want all the details on sizing your nails to your joints, check out last week's video. Now I'm going to rabbit my front and back boards, and I want to use my homemade rabbit plane for this, but it's too narrow. Luckily, you can cut perfect rabbits without any kind of rabbit plane. My Japanese cutting gauge is perfect for these cross grain cuts. It marks the line and severs the fibers in one operation. I've also got a standard marking gauge that's going to give me my depth. I'll set up a stop to push against, and then I can use my widest chisel to make a little knife wall, which guides my saw as I cut the shoulder. That cut makes it safe to quickly knock out most of the waste without splitting the board. I use a bevel up chisel to peel the wood smoothly away from my line getting me very close to my finished depth. And my homemade router plane finishes the joint by making the floor exactly the same all along the rabbit. This cross grain work can be rough, so you want to swivel the plane and get a smooth slicing cut while giving the left side of the tool firm downward pressure. This keeps the bottom of the router plane registered against the board and makes the floor of the rabbit perfectly level. I still get some roughness in this soft pine, so I made a quick sanding block. There's no sandpaper on the edge of the block, so my shoulder stays crisp as I work the bottom of the joint. There are a lot of steps in this process, but it goes quicker than you think. And once you've mastered it, you can cut any size rabbit you want, and you won't be limited by your rabbit plane. Now we need to make the ends of the chest. And they're the most complicated part, but they're still not very complicated. Here's what we want our completed end to look like. It has notches to hold the front and back, a dado to hold the bottom, and this decorative curve that defines the feet. We want the two ends to be perfectly identical, so the best thing to do is stick them together with blue tape and super glue and work on both at once. This really minimizes mistakes. When I shoot the ends, I get both pieces together, and they're perfect. That foot detail looks difficult, but you don't even need a compass to lay it out. This is a classic shape called a Roman OG, and it's just a pair of curves laid out along a line. I'll put the details in the plans. I like my shop-made turning saw for this kind of work, but a coping saw would work too. There are tons of decorative options for these feet, and you can just look around the internet to get ideas. If you can saw close to your line, then there's just a little bit of cleanup to get smooth, fair curves. I've got all the layout for these curves in the plans, so you won't have to guess at anything. The notches are easy to cut, especially if you get down on one knee to give that saw a shallow angle to track the line. We rabbited the front and back first because the depth of that rabbit tells us how deep these notches need to be. Once they're cut and cleaned up, I just need to cut the dado that's going to hold the bottom. It's a lot like cutting a rabbit. It starts with a knife and a chisel to make a knife wall, and then you can saw the bottom shoulder. Then you can be really aggressive with your chisel and get down almost to full depth. Instead of measuring from my top shoulder, I like to lean the actual stock into the joint and trace it with a knife before I saw it. I'm deliberately making this joint too tight because it's much easier to adjust the thickness of the bottom than to change the width of the dado. As I remove the waist and trim the joint to final depth, I'm concentrating on crisp lines more than anything else. Fitting the bottom later will be easy, but a sloppy joint line will show forever. Once I pop those sides apart, I'm ready to assemble. But there's one more little detail I want to add. A lot of old chests have this extra part called a till. It's just a little box built into one end of the chest. Not only does it give you extra storage for little things like needles and thread, the lid of the till can also be used to brace the whole chest open. It's a brilliant little addition, and I want it. The pieces of the till are just held in shallow grooves in the front and back, and these need to be exactly parallel for the till to come out straight. So I'm going to use my tape and glue trick again. Once I get the layout done on one side, it's easy to wrap it around the edge and duplicate it on the other side. The layout is the tough part. After it's done, I'm just cutting shorter versions of the joints we've already made. It's really amazing how much work you can do with a knife, a saw, a chisel, and a homemade router plane. The grooves don't need to be very deep either. About an eighth of an inch is plenty. And once I'm done, 
I'm actually ready to assemble the piece. Because I took the time to figure out my nails in a test joint, there are no surprises here. I'm starting with the back, so any mess ups won't be visible, but drilling the pilot holes and driving the nails is smooth sailing. With the back installed, I can flip the whole piece and get the bottom fitted. The stock is both too long and too thick to fit, but that's on purpose. A narrow saw cut fixes the length, and I just use a smoothing plane to bevel the underside until it fits those tight dados. Cutting the bottom to fit the joint is a foolproof way to get a perfect part. Unless, like me, you cut the bottom too short. Twice. Seriously, I have no idea how I did it, but I cut it too short the first time, no problem, there's spare stock, so I got a piece of that and cut it too short again. So I went back to Home Depot, got another piece of wood, cut a bottom a third time, and that one fit. So the next time you mess up in the shop, don't feel too bad about it. So here's the third bottom sliding home like a puzzle piece. Now I can make all the till parts, and there's plenty of scrap wood sitting around. For small parts in straight stock, the axe is always faster than the saw, and pretty soon I'm fitting the till and setting the top in place. At this point, I'm a pro at driving these nails, and the whole piece is starting to feel tight and solid. I also drive a couple of fine finished nails through the ends and into the bottom for extra insurance. I keep these nails near the center so the bottom has room to expand and contract with the seasons. Now you might notice that my rabbits are overhanging the sides a bit. That was on purpose. Leaving the rabbits extra long gives them more resistance to splitting when you drive those big cut nails. I picked up this trick from Joshua Klein's excellent book, Joint, which might be the best book I've ever read on hand tool joinery. Klein gets it done with exactly zero screwing around and with the most basic tools. I get nothing when you buy this book, but I'm still going to link to it down in the description. Oh, and trimming up those rabbits is a breeze. All you need is milking stool, shelf liner, chest, and smoothing plane. It only takes a few minutes on each end, and your rabbits end up perfectly flush. If you've got a few tiny gaps in your joinery, throw in a little super glue and sawdust to close them up. You only want to use a tiny bit here because of that cross grain construction. You can get away with a little glue as filler, but not much. Okay, we're coming down to the finish, and the last big part is the top. You can see I'm screwing battens to either end. Those are going to keep the top from cupping when summer gets here, but they can't be glued on because they're also cross grain. So I'm using screws, and I've taken a little round file and widened out the screw holes a bit. Now the lid should stay flat but it's much too plain the way it is. Historically, even simple chests had molding around the trim. My favorite molding profile is the classic thumbnail shape, mostly because you can cut it without any special tools. It's just a shallow rabbit along the edge, and then you round over the corner with a smoothing plane. Carrying the profile around the corners is challenging because suddenly you're going cross grain, but if you pre-cut your lines and bevel the end grain, then you shouldn't have any problems. Lots of people cut the ends first, so any mess ups will get cut away when they do the long edge. Honestly, I should have done it that way, but I forgot. Now I'm going to install the lid to the till. I'm just using cheap hinges, but they need to be mortised in pretty deeply so the lid will still close. At this point, you might just install the chest lid and call it done. But the finished chest might look a little plain. Here's an example. This is a perfectly nice chest, but to me, it looks sort of like it's up on stilts. It's that big open space underneath that gets me. I need that filled in just a little bit. Some of the slightly fancier examples have a nice molding all around the bottom, and that divides up the case and the legs. It helps, but it doesn't quite get me there. I probably looked at a hundred of these before I found this one. I think whoever made this chest was a genius. They added this one piece of trim on the front that fills in the bottom, makes the legs look three-dimensional, and gives the impression of trim all around, even though the molding doesn't wrap around the ends. This is the perfect decorative touch to make our chest a piece of fine furniture. And it's not difficult either. I've planed this piece of scrap wood down to make it a bit thinner, and now I'm cutting that same thumbnail profile along the edge and ends. It's going to be pointing up in the final piece, so it'll look different than the lid, even though it's the same shape. A little layout gives me a decorative bracket foot and my oil can has a nice, tight radius for those curves. It looks complicated, but I can cut out the entire detail all at once. There's no need for glue with this piece either. 
A couple of finishing nails is all you need. Once I have the big lid installed, I can test out my till and see how it holds everything open. More importantly, I can sit back and think about how I turned a pile of cheap home center pine into a real piece of fine furniture. I'm going to finish this with milk paint and a little shellac for luster. And I think I'll ask my wife to pick the color. She can pick where it goes, too. I just wanted to make it. You know, a few years ago, I was a completely power tool woodworker, basically. And I was pretty good at it. I mean, I did custom work for a living. And then I made the transition to mostly hand tools, and then to completely hand tools. And a weird thing happened, which is for a while I sort of sucked at woodworking. My skills just seemed to not be there anymore. And it's just because hand tools are harder. I'm not taking a dig at the power tool crowd, but power tools do have guides and fences and built-in precision that you just don't get when you're doing everything by hand and eye. And you know, if you've recently made the transition from power tool work to hand tool work, you might feel like your skills have just suddenly gone down a bunch. You might have some problems with confidence. But I'm here to tell you that is temporary. If you keep working and practicing, you will get right back to where you were, and then you might even exceed the skills you had. This happened to me with this project, with this blanket chest. This is the first thing I've made since I transitioned to hand tools, where I feel like it could not have been 1% better if I had used fancy machine tools. Everything is crisp and straight, and the curves are all fair and pretty. It's exactly what I want, and I did it all with just my hand and my eye, and coordination. So if you're struggling with that transition, this project might be a great way to bump your skills back up to where they were. And to help you out, I have a great set of very detailed plans. They're always super affordable. And you can get those at rexkruger.com store, or you can click the link down in the description. Just like last week, I've also got to shout out Chris Schwartz, one of my favorite woodworking authors. He wrote an amazing article about six board chests in Popular Woodworking Magazine, and I probably couldn't have made this video without all the details in that article. It's free online, and I will link to it down in the description. I also want to mention that Chris is the editor of Lost Art Press, by far my favorite producer of woodworking books, including Matthew Bickford's Moldings in Practice, which is the nerdiest, most in-the-weeds book I have ever read on woodworking. And I love it. I read this thing like a romance novel. Not that I read. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to support this content. So go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out all the early access, exclusive content, and rewards that I have for the people who make this stuff possible. I wouldn't be here without my patrons, and I always want to thank them. I also just want to thank my viewers, because it's great to have people watch these videos. Thanks so much for watching.